We're going to go through and look at enthalpy, entropy, and Gibbs free energy. I want to go through this and look at the technical definitions of these to start, but then to really advance what the purpose of these three things is and how an introductory chemistry student should view these in terms of being able to make predictions and learn stuff about chemistry. Okay, so we're going to start with delta H. Delta H is enthalpy. So our definition of what enthalpy is, is that enthalpy, actually I'm going to go with a change in enthalpy. Switch colors here. So we're going to say dH, the differential of, of enthalpy, is equivalent to differential of internal energy plus pressure times the differential of volume, assuming the pressure is constant external to this, otherwise I would have a second term up here which would be VDP. So this is what enthalpy is as a definition. Um, the problem with this is that while we're trying to figure out what this is, that might raise the question of what is this and what's going on here. So DU is the change in internal energy which is defined as how much heat is added to a system and how much work is done in a system which would then raise the question of what's going on here and what's going on here. And so we can kind of see a chain going on here, but that's, that's kind of the point. Now, enthalpy is definition is a very technical and confusing thing. And then we often make simplifications. We'll say, let's ignore any work going on, because usually that's a small amount. We'll assume du is equal to dq, and plug that in over here. So you might have seen enthalpy as q plus the pressure volume work. And then we might say, let's assume this is just non-gaseous materials, and so therefore we can almost ignore this term. So then we say that enthalpy change is equal to dq. There's lots of things you can do with this that are all valid under certain conditions, but it is a highly technical term. The purpose of it, though, is a much more important thing for you to understand. So the purpose of enthalpy is it's a way of looking at the energy of a system in a very convenient fashion. And here's what's so great about enthalpy. When we're doing this, we're really what we're trying to do is we're trying to split up between system and surroundings. And there are some problems with that. Ideally, we want to make our measurements of the surroundings. It's really hard to look at a chemical system or a chemical mixture and then be able to go through and say, you know what, here's how this is all changing and here's how the total energy of everything in there changes. It's really hard to assign values to intermolecular forces and at different lengths and different temperatures in a very consistent fashion to assign an energy value to a system. But it's really easy to look at how the energy of surroundings changes. Okay, so what we want to be able to do essentially is we want to be able to look at the change in the energy through a heat transfer of the surroundings and set that equal to the enthalpy change of the system. Now here's what's awesome about that. It's easy to track the energy change of the surroundings for many scenarios. If you have something surrounded in a calorimeter or surrounded by water, you can easily track the heat exchange with that. And you don't have to worry about all these other terms because that's the only thing going on in that. You're just changing the temperature, and so therefore you only have heat going on. And we know that dq is equal to the enthalpy change of the system, even though this is more complicated. So yeah, so we know exactly what's going on here with the surroundings and all the energy is going into the system or out of the system or whatever. But the system itself has really complicated things going on. It might have pressure volume expansion work going on. It might have some other kind of expansion work going on. It might have heat going on to it and work going on. It might only have one or two of those things. But the point is, is that we know that the total of all of those things is equal to what's going on heat-wise in the surroundings. And that allows us to make easy measurements here and then equate that to here using conservation of energy in the first law of thermodynamics. So this may look overwhelmingly technical, but the point of it is experimentally allows us to simplify down into just what's going on in terms of heat of the surroundings and then equating that into what the energy change of the system is. And that energy change might involve work and heat, and that that's okay. okay. So this simplifies down that whole process there, that whole exchange. Now, for the signage of enthalpy, let's switch over to deltas now. So if delta H is negative, that means exothermic. And if delta H is positive, then we're looking at something that is endothermic. That's usually what you're told. This is very incomplete. So we want to move beyond this. When we say delta H is negative, that's being applied toward a system, usually a chemical system. So when we say exothermic, that's exothermic with, res with respect to 
or with regards to your system. Which means that if you have delta H is negative for a system, then it's exothermic for your system and endothermic for the surroundings. Delta H is positive means endothermic for your system. But that's going to be exothermic for your surroundings. That's a really important distinction because to a novice chemistry student, someone who's just starting to learn those things, that might be really confusing in specific scenarios. For example, a lot of people will ask the question, what happens when ice melts? And to a chemistry teacher, we've already experienced this enough to go, oh, well, that's an endothermic process. And they might go, okay, I'm going to do a chemical reaction. I do a reaction as RxN. I do a chemical reaction in solution, and my solution increases in temperature. And to an experienced chemist, they'll go, okay, that's exothermic. What they're glossing over, though, that the novice student might not get, is that when ice melts, and I say that that's endothermic. It's endothermic with respect to the ice. The ice is my system. So therefore, it makes sense that as the ice melts and I gain energy from the surroundings, that it's endothermic with regards to the ice. But in a reaction and solution, the solution itself, the chemical mixture inside the solution is your system. The surrounding water is actually considered part of your surroundings. So when the increase in temperature goes up, to a student they would say, oh, this is hot, this is hot, they're both the same. But the problem is, is that this is my system and this is my surroundings. And that's why this gets assigned exothermic and this gets assigned endothermic. And if we don't really strongly clarify that system and surroundings component, and we don't clarify that every single system and surroundings exchange of energy has an exothermic and an endothermic process going on, that can become very confusing even for very simple things. Okay. Now, to calculate enthalpy, there are four ways you can calculate enthalpy. The first, probably I would say most important, is, is going back to here. If you look at the heat exchange with the surroundings, and you divide that by the moles of chemicals involved in your reaction, okay, and how this is determined is based on how you write out your reaction. But if you look at those two things, that's going to be equal to your enthalpy change of your system. Okay. Now, the signage on this is going to depend on how you interpret surroundings and systems here. But essentially, if your surroundings increasing in energy, then you know your system is decreasing in energy. So really, we should have a negative sign here. But just keep in mind that really when you're doing this, the best way to do this is at the end to assign your sign of positive or negative based on whether it's exothermic or endothermic. Okay. Now, the Q in this case is usually going to be interpreted as an MC delta T for a specific heat capacity problem. So I do a chemical reaction in a solution, and I have a mass, a specific heat capacity, a temperature change. And then I'm going to go ahead and divide that by the number of moles of my chemical from the system that are reacting. Okay, so that's the first way to do the calculations. And most of the other ones actually derive from this. So the second way to do calculations with regards to enthalpy is using what's called Hess's law. So Hess's law is the same thing as doing number one, it's just already partially been done for you by other scientists. So in Hess's law, you're going to have an unknown reaction, unknown reaction, where you don't know the enthalpy, and it's really hard to measure for some reason. For example, diamond converting into graphite is incredibly slow and difficult to get to happen. You have to be at really high pressures, really high temperatures, and even then, it's not a very functional reaction. So it's really hard for me to make a measurement in a calorimetry experiment for diamond turning into graphite. What I can do instead is I can take other reactions that I do know, so some known reactions, where I can easily measure the enthalpy change for using this method number one. So I can react diamond by burning it, I can react graphite by burning it, and if I make the same products in that, I can combine those two equations to turn into the equation that I want to know, and I can then combine their enthalpies to form the enthalpy of the reaction that I would like to know. Okay. The third method also goes along with that. It's a slight variation on that. It's using enthalpy of formation values. So same idea. Enthalpy of formation is how much enthalpy change there is to change elements in their standard state into a compound. And so these are values that have been experimentally developed using these methods by scientists really well, and so you can find them in a table. For that, you would add up all of your product values for all the enthalpy of formations, you would add up all of your reactant values, and then the subtraction of those two would give you your standard enthalpy of your reaction. Okay, this is actually just like a Hess's law problem, except that you're going to like an intermediate of the elements in their standard states, 
as kind of one of the reactions and then going back from those to the products as your other reaction. Okay. The fourth method is the least reliable of the bunch. So you're going to see this last and, and probably not as commonly. Uh, some of you might not even do this at all in your class. But bond energies is the final way to do this. And so the reason, the problem with bond energies is that they're inconsistent depending on the surroundings. So if you have a carbon-carbon single bond, it depends on what else there is adjacent to this, how much energy that's going to take to break. So the intermolecular force is involved in that, and the surrounding uh, steric impacts, as well as the electron, electronegativity, changing densities, polarization, all those things affect these. So you can get a decent answer using this um, by adding up all the bond energies. Now for that, for the bond energies, you want to consider the fact that for a bond breaking, you're going to have an endothermic process. So, so you would want to assign those to be a positive enthalpy change. And then for a bond being made, that would be an endothermic, or I'm sorry, exothermic process uh, for a bond being formed. So really what you would do in this case is look at all the bonds being broken, add up all those values and assign it a positive value. All the bonds being formed, add up all those and assign it a negative value, and then just combine those two. If you're forming more energetic bonds than you're breaking, you're going to end up being exothermic. If you're breaking really strong bonds and forming really weak bonds, you're going to end up being endothermic. Okay. Now, to emphasize this again, the definition of enthalpy is overwhelmingly confusing and technical. The purpose of it, maybe even is a little bit along those lines as well, but it's here where we start to get into the chemistry components that are important. The idea that you're looking at what happens in your surroundings to impact your system and to gather information then about what energetic changes are occurring in your system. Okay, so let's move on to entropy then. So entropy is a little more confusing, I think, than enthalpy, but it's also a little brief. So our definition of entropy. So entropy uh, was first coined by Rudolf Clausius, who took the word trope, which means to transform, and surrounded by parts of the word energy. So it's essentially an energy transformation. His definition of this, ds, was the change in Q divided by the temperature T. Okay, so that's the first definition. And then later, I believe it was Boltzmann came along and defined entropy as uh, a constant times the natural log of the weighting of the system, uh, where the weighting of the system is kind of all of the different possibilities in a statistical probability distribution. Okay. Very highly technical things. So at that point, none of these are going to come up in a high school chemistry class and maybe in an introductory chemistry class. So teachers have imposed other definitions upon these. So they said things like entropy is disorder, or entropy is the distribution of energy. Of those two, the distribution of energy is a better term, but really these are what your definitions are. The other things are an attempt to physically interpret these quantities. And when we do that, we lose sight of the fact that the whole point of this was just a mathematically defined function that somebody created to do an analysis of something. It's the purpose of this that matters more so than what the actual definition is, especially for entropy. So the purpose of entropy is to make predictions about whether or not something will happen. One of the observations we see with regards to entropy is that with these particular functions, they will increase in a net for nearly all situations. It is very rare where you can get the entropy of the universe to decrease, and even when you do, it's for a very temporary uh, kind of fleeting moment that you can somehow transfer heat uh, to something hotter to make it something hotter and something else cooler. Uh, and it doesn't happen on a large scale, just on a micro scale. So we want to be able to use these to make predictions about what things will happen and what things won't. That's the purpose of this. So to do that, let's look at the signage here. So if delta S is positive, that means that I'm getting a wider distribution of energy. There are two ways for that to happen. The first way is one of the things that can happen with, with entropy distribution is if I get more energy, or as I get more energy, then my entropy is going to go up because that energy is going to get distributed more widely. Okay. Um, examples of more energy. If temperature goes up, that's going to be an increase in entropy. If I melt something, if I uh, boil something, if I vaporize something, if I sublimate something, 
all of those are going to be increases in energy, and therefore increases in entropy. The other thing I can do is I can expand the space that I am occupying, expand the volume that I'm occupying. So a gas expanding, it's going to be an example of that, uh, and that's going to be entropy going up. There are also some other minor things that you can kind of clue in from all of this. Uh, larger molecules have larger entropies than smaller molecules because they have more ways to distribute energy. Um, and uh, dissolving of salts, uh, salt is very uh, localized in its energy distribution. Generally speaking, as you dissolve a salt, the entropy is going to go up. Okay. If delta S is negative, obviously my entropy has to be decreasing. Here we're going to see less energy, or we're going to see a decrease in volume. Uh, we're going to see temperature decreasing. Uh, things like freezing, condensing, deposition. Um, if we see a gas contract, or if we see crystallization, that's going to be another one that comes up. And then one of the overriding themes of entropy is that gases have a lot of entropy. They have a wide distribution of energy. And so the, if you ever have a situation where you end up making more gas molecules than what you started with, or ending up with fewer gas molecules than what you started with, that's going to be a situation where that kind of generally a priori will affect your entropy change more than anything else. Now, how to calculate entropy is actually really complicated. You're not going to see this typically in a regular uh, high school classroom. Um, but the assumption here is you assume that the entropy at absolute zero for a crystalline substance, there's zero Kelvin, you assume the entropy to be zero at that point. Uh, and then what you can do is you can use a specific heat capacity of that substance to calculate what the standard entropy will be under regular conditions by doing some um, fancy math that I'm not too familiar with. Uh, but anyway, what you can end up doing is you can find a standard entropy value for all of these substances. Okay. So that has been done for you. And just like with enthalpy, with the enthalpy of formations, number three, you can, you can look up entropy values in a textbook, in, in, a, in a table in the back of the textbook, and then you can add up all of the product entropies and subtract all of the reactant entropies to end up with your change in entropy as far as this particular process goes. A lot of entropy, though, is really about signage. Uh, we're looking for whether entropy goes up or goes down, because when entropy of everything goes up net, that's going to happen naturally of its own volition without work being done. If the entropy of a situation goes down, that's not going to happen. We're going to have to do something else somewhere else where the entropy goes up by more than that to get that to work. Okay. Um, so often you can sit there and say, oh, I melted something. Well, then I know the entropy went up. I don't need to necessarily know its value. I know that's going to happen as long as these following conditions are met. Okay. Now, enthalpy and entropy combine to give us Gibbs free energy. So Gibbs took Clausius's work, and then he really went through and kind of extrapolated it into what it is. So the definition of Gibbs free energy is this du plus pdv under constant pressure minus tds, where ds was taken from Clausius. Uh, and then Walter Nurst came along and combined this into the enthalpy term that we see now, where we see dg is equivalent to dh minus tds, or we can write this using non-differential terms, gives free energy change is equivalent to enthalpy change minus temperature times entropy change. So to summarize, we have a highly technical definition of what this is. We have a highly technical definition of what this is. Both of those serve some purposes. But the biggest purpose that they have in chemistry is they combine using this equation to give us this new term that is defined by a multitude of technical definitions into a new quantity, and that new quantity then can make predictions. So the purpose of delta G is that delta G tells when something is spontaneous or not spontaneous or at equilibrium. So it tells whether or not something will happen on its own making 
without any work being done for that process. Okay? So that's kind of the entire physical interpretation of it. So, so for signage, if delta G is negative, that means that it is spontaneous and will occur, barring, barring occurring so slowly that it effectively is not happening, okay, which does happen sometimes. If delta G is positive, it is not spontaneous. And if delta G is zero, then we're at equilibrium. So we're in a case then where we've minimized our Gibbs free energy and, and therefore we can kind of take from that, that that whatever process is going on is going to kind of stay in this stable state. Now, one of the interpretations of Gibbs free energy, uh, if you get into really high thermodynamics, especially in a physics application, is that it's how much energy you can take from a chemical process to produce work from. So it's a theoretical limit on how much energy you can get out of a set of chemicals under a set of conditions. Um, so this is how much energy I can get from my battery or from this combustion reaction to make it a usable work. To calculate, there are two ways. Method number one is the same as we've seen all day. We can calculate the sum of all of the enthalpy, I'm sorry, Gibbs free energies of all the products. We can calculate, we can sum up all of the delta G's for all the reactants. And the difference in those will be the uh, change in Gibbs free energy for my reaction. The other way is we can use this equation. If we know the enthalpy change from a previous set of information, we know the entropy change and we know the temperature, we can then calculate that. Now, there are two ways this breaks down. This method obviously is going to use numbers itself. This method can use numbers or it can just use signage. So that's a really important thing. So for signage, if we're looking at this equation, let's kind of make ourselves some room here. So if we're looking at delta G equal to delta H minus T delta S, it is very common that we can tell when delta H is positive and delta S is positive, when they're both negative, when we'll when one is positive and one is negative, and one's negative and one's positive. There are four different combinations possible here. If both of these are positive, if both of these are negative, and so on and so forth. Now, what can be done then is we can use this to kind of mathematically say, well, what's the possibility here? Delta H being positive makes delta G be positive. Delta S being positive makes delta G be negative because I subtract it. Temperature has to be positive. Okay. So I have one thing making delta G positive, one thing making it negative. The winner of those two to determine whether delta G will be negative, delta G will be negative when the delta S quantity is greater than the delta H quantity. So that's going to happen at high temperature. Specifically, we want to know when T delta S is greater than delta H, at least in terms of magnitude. At that point, delta G is going to be negative. If delta H is bigger than T delta S, then it's going to be a positive value that's not going to happen. For the negative and negative, the negative delta H makes delta G be negative. Negative delta S, subtracting a negative, makes this be positive. So for our second case, delta G is going to be negative at low temperature only. And that's going to occur when delta H, which we want to be negative to make delta G negative, when delta H is greater than T delta S. Okay, so when the temperature gets lower and lower, that makes this quantity smaller and smaller, and therefore I end up with a negative delta G. This being positive makes this be positive. Subtracting a negative value from that makes this be positive. Delta G for this third example is going to be positive always. That is never going to be a spontaneous reaction. It will always be non-spontaneous. And then our final example, delta G is going to be negative always. This is always going to be something where this reaction will be spontaneous. Okay. So from signage, a lot of our physical situations we can look at and analyze. So for example, if I'm taking ice and turning it into liquid water. Okay, and let's go with a reversible process here. Okay, so solid into liquid is an endothermic process. We know for that the delta H is positive for that system. Delta S is also positive because we're increasing our entropy because we're adding energy to our system. So in that case, we know that this will be spontaneous, delta G will be negative, at high temperature. Well, that temperature is going to be about 273 Kelvin because that is the melting point of ice. If I'm above 273 Kelvin, this process will happen. If I'm below that, it won't. 
If I'm at 273 Kelvin, I'll have an equilibrium where I'll have some ice and some liquid present. Okay. So, if I can kind of leave you with one big idea, it's this. The definitions of these are something we kind of go back when we get stuck. These are very confusing things. So, as a student, you may go back and say, well, I don't understand what Gibbs free energy is. I need to look at the definition of it. You're not going to get a lot of value out of the definition. It's much more important to look at what the purpose is. An analog that makes a lot of sense to me for this is something in physics called momentum or energy. So, momentum, P, is defined as your mass times your velocity. That's not a thing. It's not like you can go analyze the momentum of a particular object. Rather, this is just a mathematical function. It serves a purpose. The purpose of momentum is that it simplifies down collisions and calculations about collisions. So if you understand this, then all of a sudden momentum becomes really valuable because you don't have to know what happens in the middle of a collision. You can take the momentum quantity here that we've defined and say, well, this is what it is before the collision. It must be some equation to this after the collision as well, uh, where there's this conservation quantity of it, and it allows me to simplify down the calculation for what my final velocity or something of that nature is. So, understanding what momentum is isn't really something that we can say. You know, you can't say, oh, this has, this is what momentum is. It's just the mass times velocity. There's no physical interpretation of that. However, for the calculation simplification, this is an incredibly convenient shortcut. Delta G, delta H, and delta S are really challenging to define what it is they are. But their purpose is to be able to make predictions. Effectively, we're boiling them down to is delta G negative, is delta G positive, or is delta G equal to zero. And in each of those cases, we have tremendous quantities of information then about our chemical system. And by signage alone, or adding numbers in, we can figure these out and then do analysis of those chemical systems. But it doesn't come from the definition of them so much as it comes from the purpose of them. The goal here is to be able to make predictions about when a chemical reaction or physical process will occur according to energy considerations that they're